Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Angie. I'm a new Java champion. Yay. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Apple Tools and the director of Test Automation University. And today I'm going to talk about visual testing, which is really interesting. But first, I want to start off with a little game of who done it. All right. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs. I was wanting my peculiars in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. How did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Thank you. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs. I was wanting my peculiars in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So did you notice the 21 changes? Probably not. I'm going to assume you didn't. But did you at least notice the dead man get up and walk away? That's okay <laughs> if you didn't, I didn't either. And that's because we all suffer with what's called unintentional blindness. And that's where new unexpected things enter your viewport and you don't notice because you're so focused on a specific task. And that's especially true when we're talking about testing our code, right? We're so honed in on whatever it is that we're developing and that feature that we may miss other things that's going on around us in the application. So how do we typically solve for this? Well, we automate the test, right? Because we know if we automate it, we can specifically say, check these things, and we don't have to remember every single time the scripts will remember to test it for us. But what if I tell you that when you're automating your tests, what you're actually doing is scripting in the unintentional blindness? Right? Because your tests are only going to check for the things that you tell it to check for. And anything else that happens will likely get missed unless the entire application blows up and the test can no longer proceed. But most times, other errors are missed if they're not explicitly put in there. Right? And you might look at like certain text on the screen or your check might say something like, oh, let's make sure that this text is present, right? But what about, can we actually see that text? Is it blending in with like the same color as the, the background of the page and so users can't see it? Is it bleeding off the edge of the page, which is something we often see in uh, different viewport sizes or is it covered? by some other element so that you can't see it, right? Now, when I tell people about these visual bugs and how they might be able to catch them, I usually get responses like, oh, that's pretty cool, but yeah, um, we don't have those kinds of problems. Let me tell you, all of the applications have these kinds of problems, big or small applications. And now that I know about visual bugs, I see them all the time. Let me give you a couple of examples. So this is Cineworld. And Cineworld is the second largest cinema chain in the world. They had a visual bug on the page that asked you if you want to store your credit card information. 
So this is funny. It looks a little silly. And if you were to open a bug for this, it probably would be a low severity, right? But let me ask you this question. Would you store your credit card information on this page? I wouldn't, right? Because this is sending a message to the user that if they didn't catch this, then they probably didn't, didn't verify the back end either. And I'm not putting my credit card information in here, right? And so your customers are starting to lose trust in your application because of these glaring bugs. In fact, Kim tweeted about it and saying, oh, people don't even, you know, test their happy paths. But I have a theory. I think they did test this. In fact, I think they automated the test. And if you automate this test, what's going to happen? If it checks for the labels, yes, the labels are there. If it checks for the radio buttons, yes, the radio buttons are there, right? Technically, this is functional. Our scripts are actually looking in the DOM in order to interact with elements. So it's never looking on the screen. And if everything is present in the DOM and everything works, then our tests lie to us and tell us that everything is fine. Here's another example with open table. So I used to live in North Carolina and North Carolina is famous for its barbecue. So I went back a couple of years ago and I wanted to, you know, catch up with some old friends. So I went to open table to make a reservation at my favorite barbecue restaurant, which is the pit, by the way. So if you go to North Carolina, definitely hit up the pit. So I uh, chose the time, seven o'clock. I want to make a reservation for seven people at seven o'clock. So I clicked the seven o'clock and this modal appeared. And it took me a minute to figure out what am I supposed to do here? Because there's nothing here in the middle, right? So as I got to looking around, I noticed these two select buttons here. And it's like, okay, well, why are there two select buttons? <laughs> why are they not aligned? And what is it that I'm selecting exactly? Because I don't see any text or labels or anything, right? So I did what any of you would do. I opened Chrome DevTools and I started digging around in the DOM to figure out what are these buttons? And when I did that, I saw that the labels actually were there. They were just as far away from these buttons as possible, right? Now, I told you, I love this barbecue. So I completed my reservation given this information. But how many people are engineers, right? Most people that are using OpenTable, they don't know about Chrome DevTools. They don't know to dig in the DOM to figure out how to use your goofy application, right? And I'm a millennial. I don't really use the phone app on my phone. So I'm definitely not calling the restaurant to make this reservation. So I was thinking, wow, how much business are they losing, right? This is a big party. Seven people. We haven't seen each other in a year. Oh, we're going to buy all the food and all the drinks. And this could have been money that they missed. So I got to thinking about how much money they were missing. Now, these aren't one-offs. This happens to your favorite tech companies as well, including members of the FANG gang. So here's Amazon, right? So this is a mobile view when someone is ready to buy. They're ready to buy this product. Not only do they want to buy the product, they want to buy multiple quantities of this product. So spending even more money, and this is the visual bug that they are faced with. Now, if we were to run this test, just like in the other examples, it, was, it would work, right? Technically, everything is here. From the DOM, it can manipulate this stuff. But from a user perspective, this is a problem. Here's Facebook, Marketplace. I'm ready to buy something. And this text it's goofy. I can't read this. This text on top of here, I can't see it. This just looks really bad and it doesn't make me want to spend any money. Again, if we had automated tests for this, yeah, text is present. It looks great. Yeah, ship it. Instagram, this one's my favorite one because it's so awful. <laughs> so Instagram, this is supposed to show a picture and some text and, you know, be really nice and interactive. The worst part of this all is that this is sponsored content, which means someone paid Instagram to have premium viewing of their post. And this is what they got in return, right? 
again, if we had automated tests for this, is this text present? Is this text present? Is this text present? Yay, yay, yay. And that's how this kind of stuff gets into production. Twitter. I can't use this with, the, with, with, with all of the tweets just overlapping each other. Google, even Google, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> for this one though, it's not that bad. You know, I almost didn't even put this one in here, um, but I got to thinking like, okay, this is a point of purchase and this text is coming off the button, which means you wanna fix it, right? You don't want this to look like this. So some highly paid Google engineer needs to stop innovative new features to go and fix text on a button, not what you want right the great news is that we don't have to live like this people visual testing can be automated so what is visual testing well visual testing is where you take a picture or screenshot snapshot whatever you want to call it but it's basically an image of your application when it's in the state that you love right this is how i want my app to look and then for every regression run, it'll take another picture of the application in its current state and compare the two pictures, right? If there are differences, it'll let you know. If not, the test passed. So this gives us that comfort of looking at the screen as our users would versus looking at the DOM, which only robots and scripts do. So in doing this, um, this is not something that's like really new. It's been around for a while, but it's been around in a dated uh, form, meaning we used to, as an industry, do visual testing by checking pixel to pixel, checking the images and comparing the pixels. But that is really unreliable and flaky because all sorts of things can happen, right? It's not really built for testing. Let me show you what I mean. So in this top example, this is our application where we love it. This is how we want our app to look. And then the second picture is a test from a regression run. This test failed. Can you see why? Take a second, see if you can see why. All right, if you said it's because of this button, then you are correct, right? So this button is bold and this one is not. Why is that? Well, this is an effect of hovering. So if you hover over this button, then it becomes bold. Well, this is an automated script, so who knows where the cursor is going to be? It just so happened to be here in this picture, and now we have a failure. The build is broken. So we have to go and look at what's wrong, only to find out, oh, we hovered over something, and, oh, right? Annoying. Here's another one. Can you see why this one failed? If you said because there's a cursor behind the word bad, kudos. So <laughs> why is there a cursor in this one and not a cursor in this one? Cursors blink, right? Duh. So now in our scripts, we would have to say, okay, after typing this, make sure to exit out of this uh, text box, but make sure that you're not hovering over any of the buttons or anything that has any other hovering effects or whatever. That's not the type of code we want to write, right? We're not in business for that. Fortunately, Applitus has come out with a better solution, which uses machine learning to be able to detect only what we care about as human beings. So those goofy pixel to pixel comparisons won't affect us, okay? So I ran this spot the difference game. I'm not gonna let you all play because you all let the dead man walk in the last game. So I'll just do this one for you. But spot the differences. I ran this through a pixel to pixel comparison and I ran it through the Applitude's um, AI API. So in doing so, this was the result from the pixel to pixel comparison. Notice it's picking up everything like little white space shifts and things. This is not designed for this type of thing that we're doing, this type of testing that we're doing, right? Versus running it through the Apple Tools API and voila, it picked out the things that we would pick out as human beings. So this is great. All right, so I'm going to show you um, an existing code base and we're gonna add some visual testing so that you can see how this works. First, let me show you the application. 
So this is a single page application. It's really simple. This is eight of my favorite books on test automation. And uh, you can search by author or you can search by title, either full or partial. So let's say we want to search for all the books that have test in the title. Here we are. Or we can do agile testing like this. And we can get the one book that has that full title. All right. And then here's the code base for this. So I have those two tests. Let's look at the first one. This is full title. So I put in agile testing. We're going to search that. And then I have two assertions. One, I want to make sure the book is visible. And then I want to make sure it's the only book that's visible. OK. And then the next test is by partial. So I say search for just test. Here are the books that I'm expecting to come back. Let's make sure that all of them are visible and they are the only ones visible. Now, let's look at this is book visible method. So what this is doing is it's finding all of the visible books on the page and then it's getting the text of them to see if any of the text match the one that we sent in. All right. So that seems OK, except there's a lot more on this book except for just the title. Right. What about the author? What about the price? What about the thumbnail? That's really important when searching for a book, because think about the last book that you bought. You probably saw it advertised or a friend showed it to you. And so when you were looking through the search results, you were actually looking for you know, same color or something that looked familiar. You weren't reading all the text if you really think about it. So that's pretty important. And none of that is being checked, right? So we could add more assertions to check for all of those things. It might be a little bit iffy with the image. We can't really verify that that looked like that without visual testing. Um, but we could do some hacks to make sure it's at least there and um, it's not giving us a 404, right? But even with all of that, even if I coded all of that, um, is that enough, right? So let's just go ahead and run these tests as is, just to make sure they work. And then we're going to mess things up a bit. So I run these two tests and voila, they pass. Beautiful. Everything is lovely. OK, now I want to go inside of the app now. I'm a back end girl and uh, <laughs> I have to dabble in some front end stuff sometimes. And I often joke about how CSS bullies me. Uh, it really does. But, you know, I like things to look pretty just like everybody else. So I'm going to just add some CSS here and uh, let's see what happens. So I go ahead, I commit this and then we're going to run these tests again. Now, when we run these tests now, pay close attention to the books. They're literally upside down. So with one line of CSS, I have flipped this application on its head. And yet my tests are still green. That's the problem, right? It's not looking at it visually or how the user would look at this, right? It's looking in that DOM and I asked it was the, the title there and it said, yep, it was. And it <laughs> didn't lie to me, but that's not what I want. So let's go ahead and comment this out, we'll fix the bug, and we're going to add some visual testing. This is what we need to be able to catch these sorts of things. So I could add the visual testing to like the test itself, but I'm going to add it at a higher level here just so that we can reuse this code. So the API to do the visual testing is called eyes, which is so perfect. I love that. OK, and uh, after we set everything up and we have the application going, I'm just going to initialize this. And let's make one little method here. We'll say we'll call this. Uh, uh, what do we want to call it? Uh, let's say validate window. OK. All right. So it's only three calls to do your visual testing. You're going to say. Open your eyes. It's poetry, people. OK, so we open the eyes. We pass it whatever tool we're using. Now, of course, I'm using Java for this because this is Java Day, but this works with any language. It works with any testing framework. So if you're using something other than Selenium, it works with that as well. 
Okay, so uh, we give it the driver, the automation tool we're using. We give it a name of the application. So we'll just call this bookstore. And then we're going to give it the name of the text. Now, since I'm putting this at a higher level, I'm going to cheat this a little bit. Close your eyes. Um, I'm just going to basically get the method that called us. And we'll pass that guy in. All right. All right, don't look at that. That didn't look pretty. Okay, so open your eyes, right? And then we say, okay, check the window. That'll take the picture. And then we just say, close your eyes. We're done. Oh, so beautiful. Look at that. All right, and then in the test, I am going to now call that. So let's just put it in, uh, let's put it in this one, the second one. So now I just need to say, uh, that's not what I called it. What did I call it? Validate window. Yeah. I want to say validate window, right? And again, that's going to take the picture. So when I think about this, do I still need the assertion to make sure that it's the right number of books? No, the picture's going to take care of that. What about the title? I don't need that anymore. I don't even need this list. Now I, it's a two line test. I say, do the action and then check everything. The mental load that this has taken off of me, I don't have to think about every single assertion that I should be making. Just check the whole thing for me, please. All right. So let's go ahead and run this. And when we run this, it's going to do all the actions like it did before. And now it's taking a picture of the screen. I don't have to do it. Applitools is doing is taking the picture. It sends this up to the Applitools cloud and it stores all of the images there. So I don't have to store anything. I don't have to worry about this. I'm really done. This test is passed. I'm done. I don't have to do anything else. But I'm going to show you where this is stored just so that, you know, you understand what's going on. But this is not a required step. All right, so I come to this Applitools dashboard. It has all of my tests here and it's showing me this new test, all right? So I can click on here and I see that, yep, it's captured a baseline image is what this is called. This is passed, great, everything is good. I don't need to do anything. Now, I wanna flip that app again and let's see if visual testing would save our butts. Okay, so let's run it again. And again, this is going to run. Uh, Apple Tools is going to take this new picture because this is part of regression, sends this up to the cloud, and then compares this with the baseline images to see if there are any issues. And notice the test has failed this time. And if we look at why it's failed, we see we got an exception. It says that there were differences found. It told me which test. It even gave me a little link to take me over there to the dashboard. Okay, so I'm going to refresh this now, and this is the new entry, and this is marked as unresolved, which I kind of like. Like, I don't want AI to take my job. People ask me that sometimes. Will AI take our jobs? Uh, <laughs> no, AI is like really here to assist, and so I like it not making this determination for me because you don't know if that's a failure or not. It could just be that, you know, my app has changed. But anyway, so I click on here and it's going to show me this is my original baseline. This is the new image and it's highlighted everything that's different here. So it caught. Yeah, your app is wrong, girl. You flip the books upside down. Now, there, this is really cool. There's, there's some pros and cons to um, using this approach. So for a pro, everything is tested. I don't have to think about the assertions. If um, anything was added here that's not supposed to be here that I didn't think to check, it's going to be caught. So the unintentional blindness has been removed from my script. Great. The con is that it's kind of checking everything, right? And that might not be the focus of my test. Like all I really care about is, are, are these books right here. I don't really care about this, but it's checking that. I don't really care about the title of the page, but it's also checking that. So if you had like um, other things, like your, your page was undergoing, you know, development or whatever, and there were certain tests on this page that you wanted to do and you still could, but there were also certain tests that you weren't touching, um, this would kind of get everything. So that's not good, right? Um, but 
this API is so flexible that you don't have to do the whole page. So you can scope it down to whatever it is you want to test. All right. Now this one did fail. So we're going to just click thumbs down and voila, that test is now failed. Okay. All right. So let's do some scoping. We're going to go to the next test. And let me, let me take this bug out. All right, so let's go to the first test, right? Because this is only one book. So I don't want to test the entire page. I just want to test that one book. So let's go back to base test. And we're going to just copy this method and make another one that'll only check whatever I tell it to check. So instead of check window, let's just say check uh, element or region or something like that. All right, and I'll say, tell me what you want me to check and instead of check window we say check elements and we'll just pass in our locator here okay all right and back to the test so i am going to remove code one of my favorite things to do is to delete some code so let's get rid of all of this remember all we need to do is say check so I'm going to say validate elements. No, not window element. Yes. And uh, I have this locator stored somewhere. Yep. Get locator. Yep. All right, cool. So I'm going to say just check this element for me. I don't want the whole page. Okay. So let's run this one now. So now what this is going to do, Applitools is going to find that region. And it doesn't have to be an element. It could be like an entire region or whatever. And it's going to basically capture this image and send that to the dashboard. So look at this now. Now we don't have that whole page. We only have the region that we care about which is awesome, right? So pros and cons, there's pros and cons with everything. So the pros, we can scope down to what matters, what we care about. We don't need the whole page and extra noise. Um, the cons of this is we've kind of added that unintentional blindness back a little bit. Um, we got rid of some because it is going to check everything with the region that we care about. But if there's anything else going on wrong with the app, then it could fail. For example, Let's say that I typed in Agile testing right here to filter these books. And let's say none of these books filter because filtering is broken. Is this going to pass or is this going to fail? It would pass because what I said was to find this book, make sure it looks visually perfect. And technically, this book looks visually perfect, and it missed that <laughs> filtering is broken. So you have to be careful. This like this AI stuff this is not. It doesn't take your job, right? Because you still have to think. You still have to craft this in a way that makes sense. So if you're going to scope this down like this, um, you can do a couple of things. One, you can maybe scope to this whole region instead of just the book to make sure that like filtering works or better yet, you can mix and match. So I have this visual assertion, but I could always add that other assertion back in as well. Uh, what was it? Assert equals and page dot get number of visible books uh, to, right? Oops, that's the wrong order. Okay, two, okay. Right. Thanks, IntelliJ, for saving me there. All right. So I can mix and match. So I have like this functional assertion and I also have the visual assertion in there as well. So you don't have to like replace everything. You use it where it makes sense. OK, so that's scoping down to an element. I often get the question, well, what about if I have dynamic content? Surely this won't work. Actually, it will. Right. So I want to show you a couple of things. Um, that we can do. For example, let's go back to this one. So in, um, in this image or any image, I can annotate this in any way. So I can do stuff like, let's say that this was um, 
we had like a, maybe this is a, a dynamic or something. We can say, ignore the title of the page. I don't care about you uh, verifying that, right? Um, or I can say, ignore maybe a timestamp or like when I'm doing mobile testing, I'll say ignore the status bar because, you know, that's always going to have notifications and dates and times and all of that stuff. So I can say ignore any part of the region. Um, I can also do different types of checks on it, which is what I want to show you now. So let's quickly just make a new test. So we'll say public void uh, dynamic layout, right? So I used to, this is one of my favorite features of it, um, but I don't use it that much. I'll explain. So I used to work at Twitter and it was really hard to test the Twitter app because you don't know what the tweets say, right? And you could stage it or whatever, but you want like these varieties and you want like to make sure real life stuff works. So the dynamic... Um, Layout is the method we used for that. So let's just, we're not going to even do a search. Let's just say validate the window. Let's get our baseline going. Not the element, the window. All right. So validate the window. Let's just run this. We're going to get our baseline. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to then switch the order of these books so that um, they're in a different order. And then we're still going to do the visual testing. Now, technically, that should fail. And it would if you were doing the pixel to pixel comparison, right? So I'm going to go in here and we're just going to swap the order of a couple of books, OK? Ah, all right. Now, if I ran this right now, of course, this is going to fail because it looks different, but there are match levels in this API. So I can do something like eyes.setMatch level. And the match levels, there's four of them. There is, let me explain them. Um, there's exact, exact that's pixel to pixel. I already told you we don't do pixel to pixel. So don't use that one ever. <laughs> there's strict. So that's the one that's run by default. Um, and there is content. So the content one basically goes colorblind and verifies your app, um, the app's content and not the color. So for example, if you have like customizable profile colors or, you know, um, things like that, then you can use content. And then the one that does the dynamic is layout. So this allows us to say, okay, I just want to, um, test the layout of this, not the content. All right. So let's run this test again um, after we have changed the order of the books. Oh, I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> it's funny. You never know how like demos are going to go. All right. So what this is going to do, this uses AI in a different way. So it looks at this screen and it basically finds the pattern between the, um, the pattern on the page. So notice that passed. And if we look at this, yeah, I want to go. If we look at this, we can see here that the cucumber book was the third in the second row. And then we change it to be the second in the second row. And it still passes because we said just verify the layout. So what AI is doing is looking at the page and determining a pattern here. So I'm imagining that pattern that it gathered from here is, okay, we have these uh, squares. They are this much width apart. All of them seem to have some purple rectangle in the upper right corner with some white text on it, uh, some big image here, bolded text followed by not bold. You know what I mean? So just kind of find in the pattern. And if anything breaks the pattern, then it will flag it. Now, just to show you that I'm not, tricking you here, you can preview this in other match levels. So again, the default is strict. So if we were to do this in the default, it would have caught that these books are not in the right order. But um, since we're doing layout, it ignores the content. All right. So pros and cons again, right? None of this stuff is just like foolproof. So the pros of this are, of course, it's very dynamic, right? Um, 
So you can really do a lot of testing with this, even in the cases of, of you know, when you don't know what the data will be. Um, some of the customers that use this are places like news um, outlets, like I said, Twitter, um, cause they don't know what the headlines or what the stories are going to be. So this is perfect for that. The con is that it's not looking at the data at all. For example, even though I switched the order of this book, what if I left the titles on the wrong books? It wouldn't catch that, right? Um, so I use this sparingly. It's very powerful, but I use it sparingly, mostly if I'm going to do something like a smoke test or something like that, or if I'm going to just want to make sure that the API layout is nice and I'm going to verify the data of everything, maybe via API calls or something like that. So that's how I utilize um, this dynamic content feature. All right. Um, let's see. So this is past, so we don't have to do anything here. Now I'm coming to the dashboard every time. I just have to stress that just to show you this stuff, but I don't really have to go to the dashboard ever um, unless it's like a failure that I want to investigate. All right. Okay. There's one more thing I want to show you. So testing one UI is painful in and of itself. But then having this test across multiple different browsers and viewports and devices, all of that stuff is really painful. If anyone has written tests, cross-platform tests, you know it's like a nightmare. You have to keep up with all of the different elements and okay, this is in a mobile view, so now I, ha I have to click the hamburger menu. And you have like all of this conditional code and stuff like this. So it's really painful. The worst part of it all is probably that the return on investment is really low because just as I've described earlier in this talk, if you are using functional testing approaches for cross browser, cross device, cross viewport testing, then you're not likely to catch those visual bugs that love to live in these different viewport sizes. So fortunately, Applitools has also ruled out um, the grid. It's called the visual, it's called the ultra fast grid, right? It's a visual grid that does visual testing across all the platforms. So it's really slick. And the way that it works is you write your code just one time. Forget all of the conditional statements. Forget all of the different elements. You just write your test. Let's say I'm just writing for desktop Chrome, right? The test that I already have there. So I write that test and I say, check my window. And what it'll do is... It's going to grab the state of my application when I call it. So I do all my actions and I say, check it. It'll grab that state, meaning it's grabbing um, the DOM, any other resources like the JavaScript and the CSS and everything. And it's going to blast it across all of the configurations that I've specified. And I don't have to have these systems. It's going to do that in the cloud as well. So it blasts that across um, all of the different configurations. And it runs those in parallel. So it's really quick. And it, the, the best part I like is that it's not running the steps all over again, since it already has state, right? So if I were, say, my test needed to create a new user and set up their profile and you know do all of these actions and give them permissions and yada, yada, yada. I don't have to run all of those setup steps across these different things. That's not what I'm testing. Call me when you're ready to test. I'll grab that state. Your user doesn't have to be on this device. I have the state here. Let me grab it, and then we can do your testing across all of these things. So it's really, really slick and innovative. So um, I do have it. Let me show you. Uh, let's see. So I've run this. Maybe I should have showed you the code. Let's show you the code first. So I can just specify my configurations here. So I'm saying basically I want to do Firefox in Chrome in like 800 by 600 and also big desktop 1200 by 800. I also want to do iPhone and landscape and portrait and also Galaxy in those uh, views as well. And then here are the tests. So I run it. It runs. And then I have screenshots for all of those different configurations. And it tests that for me. <sighs> Magic, right? All right. So that is visual 
testing in a nutshell. Um, really powerful stuff. This is just the tip of the iceberg of things. Um, there is a free of plan, so you can sign up for this. It's not a trial. It's forever free. Um, so you can sign up for this and utilize it if you want to. And um, yeah, that that it's it's really powerful. You can do things like uh, if there was a failure, you can do like a root cause analysis, and it'll show you um, like what exactly changed in your DOM or your CSS, um, so that you can pinpoint the bug right away. Integrates with Jira and all that good stuff as well. All right. So, what questions can I answer? Are there any questions? Yes, there are plenty of questions okay. um, ranging from kind of low level, like um, how does it deal with this to higher level stuff. So these might be not completely in order. All right. Um, uh, I, I mean, some of these as well, they were asked at the start of the talk. So you may have actually answered some of them during the presentation. But okay. I think it's worth reiterating them anyway. So, for example, what happens if a book is just a few pixels too big? I'm guessing they asked, the question is, is that a failure case or not? Okay, so if the books, let's say, let's say that, well, let's go to a, a different one. Let's go here. Okay, let's say that, ah, I want to give you one where you see two. All right, so let's pretend that this was beautiful and this was like a couple of pixels higher or something like that that would fail right because it's not the same it doesn't look the same anymore so it'll fail basically be an unresolved state to say is this what you want now let's say that is what you want we've made the books a little bit bigger now and it has changed to say that, okay, this is how it should look from now on, you just simply click the thumbs up and that will save this as your new baseline. And also you can scope this to everything. For example, let's say the title of this application changed, right? We don't wanna go through all of our tests and update this and you know we can just say okay yeah this is the new title, click thumbs up and apply this to all my tests and it'll automatically um, pass all of those as well and create new baselines for those as well. I mean, this does seem like a really good blend between, so when you're writing your tests, you're writing Java code and testing in a kind of like almost unit test kind of way. Um, and then you have this uh, kind of, well, this visual thing on the back end. So it seems like a really good blend between um, the sort of code level stuff, which I've seen before with like Selenium, um, and then the pixel level stuff that you were saying, like this is the pixel level stuff just doesn't work because it's too fragile. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and so there's a bunch of questions, I guess, related around that to some extent. Uh, where does visual testing lie in the testing pyramid? And I, I'm assuming it mean, means by testing pyramid, like uh, integration testing versus unit testing and so yeah. forth. I have this at the UI. So it verifies like uh, desktop app, I was not, not desktop apps, but you know, like web apps and mobile apps. Um, so I have this at the UI. I saw someone write a blog post that really kind of put visual like above and added like this new layer to the pyramid. I don't know if I would go that far. I would say this is right at the UI level. It's just another tool to use at that UI level. I mean, I'm assuming with a lot of these tests, they are full integration tests anyway. You've got like the back end or at least some sort of stubbed thing. So they're, they're never going to be as cheap as a, as a straight unit test. There's always going to be some cost associated with it. Exactly, exactly. And um, the thing is, we, we often talk about not having so many UI tests. And the reason for that is, you know, they're expensive to write, to maintain, they can be fragile. This kind of takes away some of that burden, right? So it's not so much I have to write anymore. My tests are now, you know, a couple of lines. Do the action, take take the, um, do the verification. Um, and then it's giving me more coverage, right? I have much more coverage than I had before. So what I usually recommend is don't go like wild with these visual tests. Sometimes people will get a hold of it. It's like, check all the things on the UI. No, <laughs> do your um, proper testing at the integration level, at the unit testing, but throw in a couple of these just to make sure everything looks good. Because as I tried to stress in this presentation, um, all of those different applications that had broken, they could have had amazing integration in unit tests, right? But 
at the UI level, it still was awful. And that's because, you know, visually it wasn't being checked. Um, and I guess this kind of ties into this as well. Um, I'll, I'll read it verbatim in case I miss in case I misunderstand it if I try to reword it. Um, what is the benefit of removing basing tests like counting elements? Can't we use both techniques for more robust results? Yeah, yeah. So that's what we did. That one probably came early. That's what we did um, in this one where we said scope it down to the element and then also make sure that it's only two right now if you we were to do this full window it doesn't really make sense to do any more assertions on that um i like to say a picture uh is a thousand assertions <laughs> and that is so true because it's already going to make sure there's two books it's already going to make sure the title is right the image is right the uh, prices, right? All of that stuff is kind of encompassing. So uh, visual testing, I think of as like a superset of functional testing. So if you're already going to have it covered by the visual test, it doesn't make sense to add another assertion unless you're scoping this down. So what I've done here in this example is I've scoped this to the element level. So I could be missing. I added basically a little bit more unintentional blindness. So with that blindness, I need to cover it in some other way. We have a bunch of questions kind of more, I guess, infrastructural around um, around the library. Uh, like, for example, can you use the eyes library on premise? Yes. So um, like I mentioned, there is a free account for this. But if you do on premise, of course, you'll need to upgrade for that. So some of the customers are, are like banks and, um, you know, health institutions, things like that. They don't want to use the cloud. So they do have on premise uh, solutions. That makes sense. Um, and it says, what is Apply Tools built upon? What is that? Uh, that's mean? very, I don't know. It seems very broad. It might be related to the next question, which is what ML framework does Apply Tools use internally? Oh, okay. Uh, don't get me the line about this. I, don't, I can't answer that right off, but there is a talk from our CTO um, that goes into like all the depths of how um, AI is used and what algorithms we're using and all of that stuff. Um, so. His name is Adam Carmi, C-A-R-M-I. So if you just Google Adam Carmi on YouTube, then you should be able to find that talk if you want more information there. Um, right. I, I think this kind of overlaps with what we were just talking about with the testing pyramid and stuff. I, I wonder about the cost benefits of these visual tests. I expect they would require maintenance because of the changing nature of front, front end. Are there tips as to when to start using them? Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I love the flexibility of it. I usually, this is what I usually do. I'll do, in fact, this is why I wrote this. So I wrote um, like a best practices guide for visual testing. Um, that's on the Apple Tools website. And um, I basically talk about like how you should do it and when you should do what, right? So not so much how to use the tool, but contextually, how should you set and structure your test. So I I prefer to do the window. That's my uh, go-to. But then I will mask anything that I need mask. And you can mask it programmatically or from that dashboard. So for example, um, like I when I do my mobile test, I'll say uh, eyes dot ignore this region right and i'll say ignore the status bar you give it the locator and i'll say like always ignore that for example and so that gives me um, a little bit more stability i don't have to worry about the test failing because of you know that dynamic nature um, if there are any like advertisements or things like that on your page something that's always changing that you don't really necessarily care to test you can also ignore those regions or um, if you want to make sure that it's there you can do the dynamic testing. So test that it's there. I don't really care what it the, the content, but make sure that it's there and it looks okay. You can do that as well. So you can mix and match these techniques. It's really, really powerful. I think that's that's the most interesting thing here to me. Um, I haven't done Selenium for a while. It's been like maybe seven years or so. So I'm a little bit behind anyway. But the I, I liked Selenium because you can write like, you know, 
proper Java driven tests, but there there are, like you said, there are some um, some weaknesses with it. And then when you're doing the sorts of visual testing we've done before, it's like, oh, it's kind of either or, I mean, it's all or nothing one way or another. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of cool. The fact that you can say, look, ignore the, the title bar um, instead of having to think about it in terms of a graphical point of view. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so there's another uh, another question which is kind of related, I guess, or may you may even have just really covered that, but it says, which approach is best for visual testing, page object model or screenplay model approach of testing? Oh, we're getting into the drama now. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm a little bit biased because I've done page object for most of my career. Um, so that's where my strength lies. Screenplay, I've seen like a lot of uh, good information written, you know, by people like uh, Anthony Marcano um, that talk about how screenplay is a better approach and kind of uses uh, the solid patterns and things. I've tried it out. I mean, it was okay. It didn't feel very natural to me and more so my concern was on um, the scalability of using such a design pattern. But I've talked with... Um, some of the people who like Jonathan Wright and some of the people that are um, really involved in, in um, developing the tools around that pattern. And they assured me that it scales very well, but I've not done it at, you know, a large scale. I've done a couple of tests with it. So I can't really say uh, which one is better. Um, I'm you just biased. have a preference. Yeah. I, I, you know, <laughs> That's fair. Mm -hmm. um, did you say I fixed my um, I fixed my brace so that I wouldn't annoy you? <laughs> I didn't notice that I, because it, you managed to fix it so so it didn't annoy me. So I didn't notice it. That's my my visual blindness there. <laughs> Thank you. Someone else earlier on today. Who was it? I think it might have been Nickel. He had the he had the braces the way that you liked it, and I was oh, like, nice. no, nice. too much space. <laughs> Um, will there be Apply Tools integration in IntelliJ either native or via plugin in the future? Oh, that's interesting. Trisha, maybe we should work on that. Maybe we should. <laughs> that would be nice. So there's no plans at the moment, is there? There but aren't any plans, but we'll take that as an item to consider. Perhaps um, people need to, uh, if people don't want it, they can create an open source project for this and they can get them to look at Marit's talk about how to contribute to open source projects. Look at that. It's a full circle, uh, yeah. <laughs> full circle conference today. Um, what else? Oh yes, this is a good question. Will the sample code be shared? Is it in a repo somewhere? I do have it in a repo somewhere. I also have. Okay, so my GitHub is GitHub uh, um, Andy Jones. That's my username on GitHub, and I have um, I have a project on there for visual testing. I also have, so I told you all I'm director of Tesla Mason University. I didn't explain what that was. It's um, a platform with free courses on all things testing. And so I have a course out there. Um, I think it's like maybe an hour or two. And uh, it teaches this as well. So if you wanted to play with it with some guided help, I will be your instructor and guide you through all of this stuff with um, some more depth to it. That sounds great. That sounds fun. Um, another comment. Oh, it's apparently aimed at me. Um, Selenium, I like to, but thinking about Cypress. Trisha, your thoughts on this? I don't know what Cypress is. Okay, so <laughs> I, I play with Cypress, and um, I like Cypress. I like, again, bias, because Selenium is what I grew up on. But um, Cypress was cool, and a lot of developers like it. But it's JavaScript only. Um, so if you're a Java person, you'll need to get your hands dirty with some JavaScript. And um, I actually had to do a conference, a JavaScript conference, and I did this talk with Cypress. Um, so that was fun to do, but... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, do, use whatever you want. I don't care what people use as long as they test their code. That's my stand. There are many more tools out there um, for doing this sort of thing. I think, I think when the sort of bull market started to open up, um, I don't know, like 
I remember when when I was doing Selenium, maybe God, maybe ten years ago. That's really terrifying. You have like units, you have like J Unit Four and Selenium, and then but now there's lots and lots and lots of tools. But it doesn't mean that it's either or. It's because it allows us to do a lot of different types of testing and a lot of different types of ways. And and then of course the answer is well, it depends. What yeah. are you trying to do? Exactly. Uh, there is a question of does, does Apple Tools have any competitors? But I'm guessing that you don't want to answer that question. No, there are no competitors. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will answer that question. Yes, um, there is Percy. Um, there is like a screener IO. There's um, Backstop JS. Uh, there's a couple of. I will say this though, since you asked, right? Um, we're the best, right? Appletools is the only one that's using AI. All of the other tools are using pixel to pixel. Um, so they're using the dated, uh, the dated approach to doing the visual testing. And um, some people have found success with it, though. There's some, you know, that are open source that people, you know, some people just enjoy using open source tools. So use whatever you want, you know, as long as you're testing your code, that's my motto. But I will say that a lot of our customers come to us because they've tried these other approaches and the pixel to pixel is just so flaky and so difficult to uh, maintain that they want the more sophisticated solution. Thank you so much. Angie. This is a great talk. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much.